Do you feel as good as you look? Because you look marvelous. And all the old people said, I didn't know her. How many are glad to be old? Anybody old? Anybody have gray hair here? Isn't it awesome? Gray hair is awesome. What did the Bible say about gray hair? It's some type of splendor for your head, like a crown. Man, God's good. Hey, um, we took a chance. Donna and Charlie took a real big risk. And they called every name on that. You know, you know, people come to our church every day for food. We like to have a great food closet. A lot of there's a lot of working poor in our in our community. So they come to our church, probably the other churches too, and they uh, get food from us. And we take their name and address and phone numbers. And Donna and Charlie called everybody and wrote them letters and said, "We're gonna we want to give you some free food. We're gonna feed you." And so we had a dinner last night at the church, and it was awesome. A lot of people, over 20. People from the community came, don't you think? At least. We had 100 people there. So we had a lot of our people there. So you got to have a lot of people for a party, right? So we had a lot of our people there and then over 20 people from the community there. And we fed them and just encouraged them. We just had a great time. And so that was just a, such a great success. So let's give Donna and Charlie a great hand. Yay. It's really hard because the first time we did it, not many people showed up. And the second time we did it, not many people showed up. But this time we had a lot of people. Sometimes you just got to bang, bang, bang and keep going after it. So that was really exciting. So, uh, man, it's exciting to do stuff for uh, people. Isn't it awesome? I love to be on the front lines of ministry. And I, I sat next to a guy at the table. I'm sorry I didn't sit next to my church folks, but the town's folks were in, in, in our church. So I had to sit with them. So I sat next to a guy, and his, his friend was deaf, and then he had a son um, who was just, man, you could tell that boy needed love. Because one of our ladies said, hey, can I give you a hug? And he just, <laughs> <laughs> little, probably about nine-year-old boy, and I thought, man, this is, we're doing some good stuff. So when God's people come together, and we take risks and do something like this, God shows up. And so it's really exciting. We're about to take another risk. You want to hear another risk? I like living on the edge. <laughs> it's not life or death. <laughs> but we're putting on a golf tournament. And we've invested money in it. Now we're trying to get people to come to it. That's like hard. Get golfers. And uh, so please pray for our golf tournament. If you're a golfer, we want you to be in the tournament and sign up. If you want to help us, uh, get sponsors, businesses to sponsor this thing. Come see me afterwards. And really pray for this golf tournament. It's going to be first class golf tournament. It's going to be really neat. And so it's raising money for our two missions trips going overseas. One trip, the ladies are doing a women's conference in Italy, outside of Venice. Well, that sounds hard. <laughs> like, I want to go to that one. And then Aaron and I, and of the Aaron, and we're, all, we're going to Brussels, outside of Brussels, and we're going to go, and we're going to help build a church. They said we're going to be doing drywall <laughs> Man, that doesn't sound fun. <laughs> so we're going to work hard to get there. When we get there, we're going to work hard. But every night we're going out to eat. <laughs> so we're going to go. What a blessing we're going to be to that church and that community. So I tell you, missions is hard work. But that's kind of what I'm talking about in my sermon today. And, uh, and I was just thinking about, you ever think about the disciples, the 12 disciples? Right? They weren't metrosexuals. <laughs> they weren't sissy boys. I want you to see, maybe the disciples look like this. <laughs> that was Peter. John. Look at that. The disciples were like these kind of guys. They're tough. Tough fishermen. Fishermen are tough? You gotta be tough to be a fisherman. Okay, show, show them the video. Do you have time for a little quick little video? This is talking about tough. This guy's tough. I love manly men. Awesome. Leaving off grid was always our dream. We always wanted to come to the country. We're not gonna make it another month. We're instructed to stay alive. I was raised off grid. I've taught my kids everything I know. Our team is a necessity. You'll have food for survival. All hands on deck. 
My resume? I'll show it to you right now. Oh, rescue a new series premieres Friday. I was raised off grid. My resume. It's <laughs> like, wow, that guy has seen some hard work. That hand needs a doctor. <laughs> Looks like, like, what do they have in the old, in the New Testament? You know, they had that disease that ate your skin. <laughs> it looks like leprosy. It looked like leprosy. Oh my Lord. But that guy is a worker. That's kind of like the guys Jesus chose <laughs> as disciples. And I want to look at it in the Bible. You got time? You better have time. Look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. Turn there in your Bibles. Just awesome. I'm not anywhere tough as those guys. So let me tell you. Of course you know that. You know that. <laughs> I am who I am. I'm a musician. I'm a lover. Matthew 4, 18. Wow. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake because they were fishermen. Come and follow me, Jesus said. I will send you out to fish for people. Everybody say, fish for people. At once, underline the word at once, they left their nets and followed him. At once, and then underline followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers from another mother named James and the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them and, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Wow, can I tell you something? As much as I love fishing, and I really love fishing. I love the outdoors. I've always been an outdoorsman. When we lived in Colorado Springs at the Air Force Academy, I would come home from school, say hello to mom, grab a sandwich, and I'd go up in the, in the, the hills, the mountains, and the woods. I love, I love, always loved nature. I love to be an outdoorsman. I fancy myself as an outdoorsman now, but I don't kill many deer, but I try. <laughs> I'm a bow hunter. And... Uh, but I try. I love the outdoors, you know? And as, love, as much as I love fishing, you know, one time I was fishing off Marathon Key in the Keys, and I caught a marlin. It took me half an hour to reel in this marlin. It was a baby marlin. It was 100, over 100 pounds. <laughs> you know how big marlin get. This was a baby. I don't think I could handle a really big one. But man, what a great day that was. And that same day I caught over 50 dolphin, not porpoise. Not porpoise, the women just looked at me bad. <laughs> Evil. Not, I caught Mahi Mahi, the fish dolphin. And one of them, we were catching dolphin, there's one after another there all around the boat. We were just, just slinging them in the boat, slaying them. And I don't know if you've ever caught dolphin, but they bleed a lot in their lips. And they're flapping around the boat, and it's a white boat, and there's blood everywhere. It was fun. <laughs> And, and we're catching these, and we're just, they're like schooly dolphin, they're a good size, right? And then, then all of a sudden this bull dolphin, he's the daddy, the bull dolphin, he was huge, like 50 pounds, and a wahoo just rose up to the surface right next to the boat. So I put my bait in front of their nose, and they wouldn't take it. We tried to catch them, they just wouldn't take it. I should have just jumped in and grabbed them, because they were that close. And my friend said, we're going to have to troll them up. So we got away from the school, we put our baits back in, ballyhoo, we trolled around. <laughs> My friend's up in the thing, he's driving, I'm the only one, I grabbed the pole. I started fighting this fish and I was like, I wonder what I got. Is it the wahoo or is it the bull dolphin? All of a sudden it jumped out of the water. Oh my the dolphin. I got the bull dolphin. Man, that thing was such beautiful and we brought it in the boat. And it was the catch of a lifetime. It was like 50 pounds. It was huge. I don't know how huge it was. Let's just say it was 50 pounds. <laughs> it was huge, and it was colorful green and blue and spots. And I was like, yeah, baby, we're fishing now. Yeah. And I remember being in Cabo San Lucas. You know where that is? I was down in Cabo, and I was on a boat, and I caught another giant mahi-mahi. It was as tall as, they get bigger down there. It was as tall as me. It was big. Not that that's very tall. But it was huge for a fish. And then I caught another one. So I caught these two giant mahi mahi. I just loved it. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. God bless. He smiles upon me sometimes, man. I catch these fish. I'm like, one time, 
uh, a bunch of us in the church were out kayak fishing right off Navarre Beach. We were out there. Nate and Deanne were out there. Was anybody else out there? Remember when I caught that giant Jack Creval? We're out there, and I caught this giant Jack Creval, man, off live bait. And I'm reeling this fish in, and finally he's getting wore out, and he starts circling the boat. And so I just held firm on my kayak, and my whole kayak started spinning around. <laughs> And he went by this kid named, this Air Force guy named Chris. <coughs> and Chris is from Alaska. And Chris reached in, grabbed him by the tail, and stuck him up inside his kayak. And I was like, got another one. One time I was out there fishing. This is a great sermon because I get to tell some real whoppers. <laughs> I was on my kayak and James Matos was out there with me. James here? James and I were out there and I caught something big and I didn't know what it was. And it starts dragging me out to sea. Right? And I was like, I felt like the man in the sea. Remember the old man in the sea book? I said, man, I'm going to fight this. I'm like spouting off. I'm going to fight this fish till I'm dead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go all the way to Mexico. <laughs> oh Where, whatever, whatever it takes. <laughs> and, and I was going so fast out to sea, like the beach, Navarre Beach is right behind me. I had a wake on the back of my kayak. Like we were like, I was hanging on. <laughs> And so I fought for like 20, maybe 30 minutes, long time. I got this fish to the boat. I was so curious. What could be so big? And it was a black tip shark. Oh. And that shark got next to the boat. And I looked at my kayak. And I was like, that fish is almost as long as my kayak. Oh. I had a 13-foot kayak. It was probably all of nine feet. And the eyes of that fish got real big. Oh, and my eyes got real big. <laughs> And he took off and started tearing line out of my reel. I was like, oh, you know, I had already tightened the drag down. It almost pulled me out of the boat. So I had a, it was fantastic. And James was keeping up with me. He was paddling. We were talking. I'm just hanging on for dear life. I brought, I brought this fish in three times to the boat. Three times I fought this fish. I was wore out. And the fish wasn't. It was as green as when I first started. And I said, James, man. What are we going to do? This thing's too big. He said, just cut the line. <laughs> and I said, did I catch this? I mean, really, did I catch the fish? He said, you caught it, Pastor. <laughs> I mean, what do you do with a shark when you're in a kayak? <laughs> you got to put it on your legs? <laughs> Man, one time I went out with, with uh, Curtis Owsley. Where's Curtis? Curtis waved to us. He's one of the greatest outdoorsmen, second only to Mike Nelson. No, I'm joking. He's a great outdoorsman. We're out flounder fishing at night on the island. We went across. He says, meet me at your mom's dock at 2 in the morning. I'm like, okay, dude. So I met him out there, and we went off, and we, we caught flounder. I got 10 flounder that night. One, one day I was out fishing with Mike Nelson, greatest fisherman I've ever met, greatest outdoorsman I've ever met. He's a former Marine. He can kill a man uh, 50 ways with each hand. <laughs> Mike and I were out fishing and we were cobia fishing. Have you ever been cobia fishing? That's world class. Right here, every April, May, cobia fishing. Cobia come through, mako sharks come in. Dangerous, dangerous fishing. We were out there fishing and uh, we threw to a lot of cobias, couldn't get any to buy it. So Mike said, we're coming back tomorrow. I said, we're coming back tomorrow. We came back the next day. We caught a cobia, brought it in the boat, and that thing was bleeding like a mammal. That blood, blood everywhere. I was like, love it. <laughs> it was some of the greatest fishing of all time. And as much as I love fishing for fish, I love saving souls even more. So when Jesus said to those fishermen, hey, come with me, and we'll be fishers of men, I was like, yeah, baby. Those men said, let's go for it. Well, we like fish and all. And fishing is really fun, but there's nothing greater than winning souls for the Lord. Isn't that true? Yeah. Have you ever won a soul? Have you ever witnessed someone and they said, you're right, man. I need to give my heart to the Lord. <clears throat> well, then pray this prayer. Let's pray this prayer. You need to start coming to church to start serving Jesus. Have you ever done that? There's like no greater high in the world than when you lead someone to Jesus because you've just affected a, an eternal soul. For all of eternity. That's a lot better than putting some fish in the freezer that you're never going to thaw out and eat. <laughs> That's incredible. You've affected a whole family for generations. Just one person, one dad getting saved can affect a, a generations of children and, and progeny. 
There's nothing greater. Do you notice who he chose as disciples? He didn't choose lawyers. You know they had lawyers around? Jesus talked to the lawyers all the time. He never chose them. You know they had doctors? Luke. Luke who wrote the book of Luke. He was a doctor. He didn't choose Luke to be a disciple. They had uh, rabbis. That would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? Okay, Jesus came down. He's going to start a new, new faith, Christianity. You think he wants some religious experts, rabbis. Wouldn't that make sense? He didn't choose them. He chose working men, workers with hands, calloused hands. Because the kingdom of God, man, the harvest is plentiful. But the workers are few. Christians don't want to get their hands dirty. I remember when we go out with Donna and Charlie and we're going to the streets and we're, we're eating, feeding people and uh, they just sit down right in the dirt. I'm like, I got my new jeans on. <laughs> but I sit down in the dirt. I don't care. You sit down in the dirt with them. Did Jesus kneel down and drew in the dirt? Yes. God is looking for workers, men who will get up before the sun. This is why he chose fishermen. Because fishermen have some qualities. Listen to this. They get up before the sun. They spend all day in the heat. It was back-breaking work. You had, have, you had to have patience, determination, and a strong will to keep on fishing when the, fishing, when the fish aren't biting. Um, you couldn't be afraid of storms or high seas. right? You had to have nerves of steel. You had to have a love of adventure. Isn't that amazing? Those are the qualities of a fisherman. They kind of sound like qualities of a Christian, too. Or we should have. Jesus is looking for some type of fisherman type of people. People with courage. People with hands that aren't afraid to work. Aren't those great qualities? Jesus chose these roughnecks right off the dock. It was a dream of every little Jewish boy. No, not to be a fisherman. The little Jewish boys didn't dream of being fishermen. The little Jewish boys dreamed of being a rabbi. Maybe one day, if I'm smart enough, if I memorize the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, they, the ones who are hardcore, those boys, they memorized books and books and books. Maybe one day, a rabbi will walk by and say, come and follow me. That was the dream of every little Jewish boy. I want to be a rabbi because the rabbis were like rock stars. The rabbis were like Michael Jordan our day. Everybody wanted to be an athlete or a, a rabbi, just like we want to be athletes today. Every kid and every mother wanted their child to grow up to be a rabbi. Boy, when a rabbi walked by, everybody knew it and everybody was in awe of the rabbi. So, man, but you know, 99% of the boys never got picked to be a rabbi, to be a disciple of a rabbi. They all tried, though. Is it any wonder that when Jesus walked up to the disciples dressed like a rabbi, a holy man, he said, come and follow me? Man, I didn't pass rabbi school. I never got chosen by a rabbi. Man, I'm an old man now. You want me to follow you? That's the dream of every Jewish boy, to follow a rabbi. Of course we'll come. I'll leave my father. I'll leave my mother. I'll leave my business, the family business. I'll leave it to go follow Jesus. Jesus said, come and I'll make you fishers of men. Come and I'll give you the greatest adventure you've ever had. We're gone. We're gone. Can I tell you something? Jesus is saying the same thing to you and me today. Come and I'll make you fishers of men. And welcome to the great adventure. The greatest adventure of your life. God's calling you to be a fisher of men. God's calling you to be a fisher of men. God's calling you to be a fisher of men. But, but I'm an engineer. Yes, you're, be a great engineer, but be a fisher of men too. We're all called, we have vocations. Yeah, be great at your vocation. Be the best you can be. Work as unto the Lord, the Bible says. Be an expert, right? But be fishers of men. I think as Christians, we forget what God has called us to be. We're to be fishers of men. We should be coming to church with men and women. Last week we talked about, I talked about unless you change and become like a little child, you won't even see the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus said. 
suffer the little children to come with me? And he said, hey, look, unless you guys change and become like one of these little ones, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember we talked about that? We talked about the qualities of a the child. There's some great qualities in the child. The other day, last night at the dinner, Trey's son, he just woke up from a nap, and, and I said, come see me. And he kind of put one arm out. I just grabbed him, and, and he, he just put his head on my shoulder and just hugged me. I was like, oh, that is the sweetest thing. I'm not even his dad. He just snuggled with me. I thought, man, I miss that. You know, that is so great. And I'm like, children have great qualities. One of the great qualities of children is they love adventure. They're climbing on everything. They're scaring their mothers to death. Little boys and little girls, they're doing stuff that is dangerous. They're, they're, they love adventure, man. But, you know, how can it be that most Christians are so bored with their faith that religion is just boring to them? How could that be? Jesus called us the greatest adventure. Wow, it's boring. It's not an adventure. You know why? Probably the biggest reason is because they're selfish. You're just plain old selfish. Here's why. Instead of answering the call and following Jesus, you answered, the, you answered Jesus and you said, Jesus, follow me. <coughs> follow me, Jesus. Try to keep up with me, Jesus. And by the way, give me that faster car. Jesus, give me a job. And Jesus, give me a girlfriend. We're, we want Jesus to follow us around. Mark Batterson said this. He said, I call it the inverted gospel. He said, and it's absolutely unfulfilling. It's not until you say to God, whatever, whenever, and wherever, right, that you begin living out the great adventure God has planned for you. Man, to truly follow the Bible and the teachings of Jesus, it is a great adventure. Well, you've got to say, Jesus, I'm on board. I'm on your board. <laughs> I'm getting on board. You're trained. <laughs> and you've got to say, whatever, whenever. You cannot follow Jesus and be bored. Amen. Many, many people don't understand that the call in our lives to be a disciple. And we are all called to be a disciple. Are you hearing me? <laughs> we are all called to be a disciple. We all have a calling upon our lives. Not just the pastors. Not just, you know, not just priests. Every one of us has a calling upon our lives to be fishers of men. Say that with me. Fishers of men. God has called you to follow Jesus and be fishers of men. There is no greater joy. No greater joy. It means we have to leave and follow. The disciples left immediately and followed Jesus. We have to leave stuff. Junk. You know the devil, we accumulate a lot of junk in our lives. I remember, man, before I started serving the Lord, I had some idols in my life. Mine were rock stars. Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath. I gravitated towards the dark side. <laughs> I had a lot of idols in my life, and I had to leave. It's no different than a marriage. You leave and cleave. You leave your father and mother, and you cleave to a wife, right? Same with Jesus. And we've got to leave. You might have some friends who are just dragging you down. You've got to leave. God might have called you. God might call you to a different career. You got to be able to say, "Hey, I'm open. God, whatever you call me to do, I have a degree. I've worked for 15 years for this degree. But God, if you want me to go a whole another course, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to leave." That's what the disciples did. They left, leave, and follow Jesus. The word says, "Deny yourself, take up your cross, and would do what? Follow Jesus." In the garden, Jesus prayed, "Not my will be done, but Your will be done." Are you following Jesus or is he in the back of the bus that you're driving? Hmm. That's why the Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. Because we receive the call to follow him and, when, and we keep doing the same things we've always done. Or we practice the Bon Jovi gospel. You ever heard that song by Bon Jovi? It's my life, it's now or never. You've never heard that song? Not quite like that. I am old. I know it. Bon Jovi, it's my life. Can I tell you something? If you're a Christian, it's not your life. It's not your life. It's not your wife. She's not your wife. 
She's on loan from God. Everything you have is on loan from God. Don't think you have own, possessed anything. It's not yours. The other day I was at my house and I was sitting there looking at my, I had this brick column. And I was thinking, man, I've got a cool brick column. I was like, no, that's not my brick column. That's the Lord's brick column. I'm just, God has given me stewardship over this. And I need to be faithful over what God has given me. God gave you a spouse and you need to be faithful with that spouse. Don't talk to your spouse like you're talking to a dog. Don't bark at your spouse. Don't belittle your man. You're, you're commanded to respect your husband. And, and women and men should love their wives. We better start watching how we treat our spouses. Because they're not yours. Those kids are not yours. Well, I had them. They came out of me. They're on loan from God. They're on loan from God. You only got a short little time to get them saved, get them discipled, before you kick them out into a harsh, cruel world full of sinners who are experts at leading Christians astray. You send your kid to college. Those, those professors start undermining their faith immediately. Immediately. Are your kids trained enough to go to college? I wouldn't even send them to college unless they were, if they knew the word, man. It's a dangerous place where many Christians go to die. Their faith goes to die. Our kids are on loan from God. Amen. Wow. Each one of us needs a Copernican revolution. In the 16th century, the astronomer, astronomer Nicholas Copernicus came up with this extraordinary idea. Copernican revolution. Up to that point, okay, that's 1600, that's 1700 years of existence, or actually a lot more than that. Centuries and centuries went by where everybody believed that everything revolved around the earth. All the planets and solar systems, everything revolved around the earth. Copernicus comes out, he's an astronomer, he started doing calculations, and he, he realized, you know what? Things are not revolving around the earth. Everything's revolving around the sun. It's heliocentric. Revolving around the helios, the sun. And that blew everybody away. Because back then, for someone to come out with such a crazy idea, they would burn you at the stake. They, would, they didn't mess around in the old days. They liked burning people. <laughs> so he came out with this crazy idea. No, man. We're so vain, we think everything revolves around the earth, around man. But really, everything revolves around the sun. And isn't that like our faith? <coughs> everything really revolves around Jesus. When you enlist to be a Christian, man, you come up and say, here I am, sir, reporting for duty, General Jesus, I'm reporting for duty, what's my mission? I want you to go and be fishers of men. What about coffee? What about barbecue? What about sports? You'll be a fisher of men. We report to our commanding officer for duty. What do you want us to do? We get our marching orders. It's all about mission. It's all about the mission. We're on a mission. It seems impossible. But I'll tell you what. Nothing's impossible with God. Amen? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you win the whole earth to Jesus? One soul at a time. You go win one soul. You just try and witness to somebody. And you pray before you do it. You pray, Lord, give me a divine appointment where I can tell people about my faith. People are not going to argue with you about your witness because it happened to you. What did Jesus do for you? They're not going to argue. No, Jesus didn't do that for you. No, they're not going to argue about that. They can't. It happened to you. You tell them what Jesus did for you and, and then say, hey, he can do it for you too. Go and make, be fishers of men. It would be greater. You win a soul for Jesus. Man, greatest thing you ever did. Amen. We enlisted in God's army. Our mission, Jesus boiled all the 613 commandments in the Old Testament. You know the 613 commandments? He boiled all of those down into one. Isn't that cool? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, your mind, and your strength. The reason why people have boring faith, why church is boring for them, is because they're selfish. It's all about me. What can God do for me? I was witnessing to these lesbian ladies who used to come to my church. They had never had any money. 
They wanted us to give money. I, one day I said, hey, go out and weed that garden. <laughs> go out and weed that garden. I'll, give you, I'll pay you for your work. And uh, so we were out there. I was out there watching them, and we were, I was talking to them. And she goes, I said, I want you to come to my church and learn about the Lord. She said, well, you know that we're... <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> she goes, and I started witnessing to her. She goes, well, God, God wants to make me happy. And I said, no. It's not God's goal for you to make you happy. God wants to save your soul and save you. Happiness comes with that, but that's not his goal to make you happy. That's the mindset of most people. God is there to make me happy and give me what I want. He's like a genie. I rub the bottle when I need him. He pops out and gives me what I want. That's not God at all. It's more like the military. Paul used the illustration of the military. We're reporting for duty, sir. What can we do for you? You died on the cross for my sins. I'm going to heaven because of you. i got a great relationship with you, Lord. You've done everything for me. What can I do for you? I'm here to report. What's my mission? Go and be fishers of men. I love people so bad. I want you to go witness that person you developed a relationship with at work. They're hurting. They're on the way to hell. They need Jesus. Yes, sir. Hey, I'm going. We already have a relationship. I'm going to go tell them what Jesus did for me. Tell my testimony. The reason why your faith is boring is because you're not living it right. You want Jesus to follow you when you should be following him. Let me ask you if you'll bow your heads. Let's pray. How many say, Pastor? I don't even know the Lord. I don't even know if, if I were to die today that I'd even make it to heaven. There's a huge question mark there. I'll tell you, I hear what you're saying. It makes total sense to me. How many of you raise your hand and say, Pastor, please pray for me. I'd like to know Jesus like you know Jesus. I'd like the Lord to forgive me of my sins. I'd like to be adopted into his family. Anybody here would raise their hand and say, Pastor, pray for me? Anybody? Yes, yes, see that hand. Anybody else? Who would like to, who would like to join the great adventure, the greatest adventure on the face of the earth? Raise your hands. Yes, see that hand. See that hand. I see that hand. How many would say to me, Pastor, there was a time in my life I was on fire for God. I followed him. I read his word. I was working for the church. I was serving so great. But you know what? I went to college. I got married. Things started happening in my life. And God took a back seat. The work of the Lord took a back seat. I don't pray to the Lord anymore. I don't read his word anymore. I'm as distant from him as I've ever been in my life. But Pastor, I hear what you're saying. I need to come back to the Lord. I'm, I'm here to tell you today, Jesus will take you back in a heartbeat. He loves you. He loves you. And it doesn't matter what you've done. God's grace is sufficient to forgive all of your sin and welcome you back as if you've never even sinned, as if you've never even left. How many raise your hands and say, Pastor, that's me. Pray for me. Anybody? Yes. Yes, I see that. I see that. Yes. Anybody else? Hallelujah. I mean, you say to me, Pastor, you know, I'm really struggling with some things in my life. Maybe you're struggling with your faith. Maybe you're confused. Maybe you're doubting. Maybe you feel all alone. Like all the world is on your shoulders, maybe. You need help. Maybe you need a financial miracle. Maybe you're even sick in your body. How many of you raise your hand and say, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. i got a serious need in my life. I need prayer. Anybody here raise your hands? I want to pray for you. Yes, 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 yes. I see those hands. I see those hands. Hallelujah. You know what? I see your hands, but God knows your need. And God notices you. I'll tell you what gets God's attention. It's when you pray. A sincere prayer from a broken heart will get God's attention. How many of you say, Pastor, I need to pray for me because I've got a loved one. Maybe it's your spouse that doesn't know the Lord and you're trying to serve Jesus in a home where another person doesn't serve the Lord, serve the Lord and you're just really struggling with that. It's super difficult. How many of you say, I just need 
I need help. I need you to save my loved one. Raise your hands. Anybody? Yes, yes, yes. Hands going up all over the place. Hallelujah. That's extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. No encouragement. But I'll tell you what, it's possible. You can live on fire for the Lord. You can have what you want. And I want to pray today that, man, God puts such a fire in your life that that fire is contagious on your the people you live with. We're just going to pray right now. I want everybody to pray out loud. We're just going to pray that God will begin to do miracles in this place. Because I'll tell you, we serve a God of miracles. We serve a God who cares about your life. God is omnipresent. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient, but He's personal. He's a personal God who loves you. He's concerned about you. And He's a miracle worker God. He's a miracle worker. So I don't care what you ask Him, boy, He's able to do it. So let's just believe, faith believing today. Are you ready to pray? Let's pray for some great miracles today. Christians, I want you to pray for those who gave their hearts to the Lord today. Lord, we love you. Just say, Lord, I love you. I ask you right now, say that out loud. I ask you right now to please forgive me of my sins. To wash me as white as snow. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Adopt me into your family. I love you, Jesus. And I want to follow you. Lord, I pray for those people who have spouses who aren't saved. Lord, we just pray that we'll begin to see miracles, salvations. Lord, that some, some switch would flip in their hearts. That they'd be open and receptive to the things of God. Lord, I pray even right now that as we go home, our spouse will just have a, flip, a switch flipped in their heart. Lord, do a miracle. Our children will have a, a, a switch that will flip in their mind. They'll be open to the gospel. They'll be asking questions. Lord, flip that switch, Jesus. Do a miracle right now. Let us hear great miracle stories. Let us see salvations, Father. We love you. Lord, I pray for people who need a financial miracle right now, that you do an incredible miracle in their finances. Lord, I pray that people have uh, uh, problems that are out of their control, that keeps them up at night where they worry till late in the evening. Lord, I pray that you do a great miracle in their lives, Lord. Let us see you do great things in us. We're calling upon you, the good God who loves us, the faithful God. You're our provider, Lord. We need a miracle, Lord. We love you. And we thank you. We humbly thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Lord, we thank you. Hallelujah.